quick audio test. Audio, testing audio, testing one, two, three. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. Today, we will be talking about new trends in education, implications for evaluation and assessment. It's going to be a jam-packed hour here, and I'm sharing the organization today with the folks at the Ontario Literacy Coalition, um, and I'm working on a Mac, so GoToWebinar works a little bit differently on a Mac, so you may be able to see the Go-To control panel at the bottom of your screen. Don't worry about that. It shouldn't interfere with our slides at all. We're just going to dive in with the presentation for today. Uh, we're going to be doing a bit of a discussion around what traditional evaluation and assessment is in literacy and second language education. And then we're going to look at asset-based evaluation and give some examples of asset-based um, evaluation. And then we'll look at some ideas and resources for you. Um, because I'm presenting at the same time and I've minimized that control panel in the bottom, I won't be able to see your chat as we go through the webinar, but you should be able to uh, chat amongst yourselves and we'll also save some time at the, quest, uh, for, at the end for lots of questions. Um, so if you have questions, go ahead and write them down and save them for the end and we'll have a bit of a Q&A at the, at the end of the session. Um, three objectives today and the first one is that I would love for you to go away from today's session with a great understanding of what asset-based evaluation and assessment is, what it means, and how you can use it. Um, and then more importantly, I'd like to give you some ideas on how to incorporate asset-based evaluation into your own literacy practice and language teaching practice. Um, and then as well, um, you know, talk about ways that we can increase student motivation or learner motivation and engagement, whether those learners are young learners, whether they're learners in school, adult learners, or senior citizens. The principles can apply across the lifespan. Um, I started with a couple of assumptions because we all have those in our in our practice, in our research, in, in what we do. Um, mine are these, that all learning is valuable um, and it's a lifelong process. So it starts the day we're born, doesn't end until the day we die, and that everybody has the capacity to learn no matter where you are um, along the continuum of learning or you know um, multiple intelligences or where you are on your life path, everybody has the capacity to learn. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about formal, non-formal, and informal learning to start. So I've, I've started here with a little circle. That's actually my dad and my little niece in um, the picture there. And it's to show that the day we're born, we start learning. We start learning in a very informal environment with our family members in our own homes. And this applies as much to language learning, learning as it does to literacy and everything around us. We spend approximately the first four to five years of our life immersed in an informal learning situation. So what's informal learning? Well, first of all, it's spontaneous. Um, there's no credentialed teachers in informal learning. So in the home, it's usually mom, dad, grandma, or grandpa, older siblings. Um, nobody has any particular qualifications or credentials. They share what they know. They're excited to help you learn. You know, if you think of a parent helping a baby take their first steps, um, that's absolutely informal learning. A lot of it is also called experiential learning. And people love it because they're doing something and they're in there and they're engaged. Um, and then around age four, 
or so in Canada, generally in North America, generally, we enter into non-formal learning. And it's our first foray out of the home as a learning environment into a more structured learning environment um, where teachers may have um, some experience, they're more experienced than their learners, uh, they may have some kind of credentials, but it's not necessary, and the programs are kind of structured, even if it's just loosely so, or loosely organized somehow. So those kinds of programs are things like um, swimming programs, mom and tot exercise programs, um, a preschool, a daycare, um, anywhere where you know people are gathered together, young people or little toddlers are gathered together, and the whole purpose is for, is for them to learn, to share, um, and to do things together, guided by an adult who knows something about what, is, what it is that they're learning. Um, and often at this stage of life, the, the child will be learning together with the parent. Um, the idea of non-formal learning continues uh, for mo many, many children in North America um, in the form of like Girl Guides, Boy Scouts, um, soccer, swimming programs, sports programs, any program that they would take in. Um, if you belong to a faith-based community um, as well, the learning that can go on there. For um, language learners, anybody who takes heritage language classes on a Saturday morning uh, in their local community center or church is also participating in non-formal learning. You don't get any credits with non-formal learning, uh, and it's really hard to recognize. But then things change. Somewhere around age five or six, we enter the realm of formal learning. And then you can see there that I've made it the prominent circle in that Venn diagram, and I've done that for a, a reason. It's because culturally and socially, formal learning takes precedence over everything else that we do in terms of how we value our learning. So in other words, getting a high school completion becomes our sort of lifelong pursuit for I don't know, six to, to eight years when we're during our, our growing formative years, and it becomes a big deal. And um, so the programs are structured. Formal learning programs have qualified, credentialed teachers. There's a strict program of studies or curriculum that must be followed. And formal learning programs are the only type of learning that are recognized by governments and institutions. So they're very high up. If you think of these in terms of a scale rather than three Venn diagrams, if you think of them in terms of a scale, formal learning would be the most elevated, the most highly recognized, um, the most prestigious, if you will, and kind of the higher up you go, the more prestigious it is. Uh, and for people that are taken out of that learning environment for whatever reason, uh, whether they stopped school in grade 10, they didn't go to school at all, or imagine that circle taken out of their experience entirely. So people who've never attended school, um, they, they don't have that experience of learning, um, you know, guided by someone who's very experienced. So think of yourself in terms of these three circles, or if you have children, um, and you know, it's a big deal when a person passes from one circle and then joins the next circle. So you know, the day that the young child might start daycare, enters the non-formal learning. The first day of school, they've entered the realm of formal learning where they'll spend many years. It's a big deal. Um, and so when you think of your learners, you can think of them in these different kind of contexts and different kind of spheres. And if you do have learners um, who've never been to school, then you can see how taking out that green circle at the top could have a huge impact on somebody's, uh, in somebody's life. And it certainly does in terms of assessment. Um, so we, you know, we enter the realm of formal learning. We stay there until we're 18 maybe for grade 12, 17, 18, 19, something like that. Uh, more fortunate people will go on to university and uh, continue their formal learning studies. And then you enter the work world. Well, what happens then? Um, what happens then? Uh, after that, you go back to the non-formal learning. So that's when you experience things like continuing professional development. You take conferences, um, you attend um, uh, courses for adults, courses for professionals, and we go back to the non-formal learning. So we go back to uh, the idea of sharing with others, learning from people who may or may not have more credentials than us, uh, and, and we go back, we don't get necessarily a degree for this, but we do engage in the learning uh, with other people. So we spend a lot of time, so for example, the Ontario Literacy Coalition had a fantastic conference last year called the Spotlight on Learning. Conferences like that are a tremendous example of non-formal learning, gathering people together. This webinar is uh, non-formal learning, so it was organized um, 
by the folks at the Ontario Literacy Coalition, and here we are gathered today uh, virtually to ex engage in this learning experience. So we continue in non-formal learning throughout our careers until we retire. Some people continue on with non-formal learning after they retire by taking more classes or perhaps teaching classes. Uh, and then as we move along further into our retirement years, we go back to informal learning again. And often people in their senior years or golden years will look to pass along their wisdom, their learning, and their own experience to the next generation. Uh, and then so you can see kind of how the, the circles of learning transform through the lifespan and how we start out and pretty much finish up in informal learning. However, um, when it comes to assessment, things are a little bit different. So I wanted you to consider three questions when we're considering assessment and evaluation of learners. One is, what is our purpose in evaluating our, our learners? Uh, why do we do it at all? Um, and when we do assessment, we gather information, but how are we going to use that information that we gather? Um, and then finally, what do we want the learners or the students, because I've taught in post-secondary, so I, I tend to go back and forth between those terms. What do we want them to do with the information that they gather? Okay, so the questions again is, why do we evaluate in the first place? Um, how are we going to use the information that we gather? And then finally, how do we want the students to use the information that they gather? So if I think about evaluation, evaluation belongs traditionally in that realm of the formal learning, that green circle at the top of the three uh, Venn diagram circles there. And it's got s about seven characteristics that we can share with you today. Um, so the evaluation is based or predicated on the assumption that the, um, the, the students don't know things. And it, the evaluation needs, is intended to show the teacher what the student does not know. Okay. Um, and that traditionally, we'll have tests that show us gaps in students' learning. Um, and that's, you know, we hear that a lot in, uh, in, in industry as well. This is sort of corporate talk, talking about gaps in learning. Um, and, uh, and, and we've taken that and used it in education as well. Um, and then the third one is that uh, evaluation, traditional evaluation is always based on a bell curve. So, uh, um, you know, we've got the F students who are outliers at one end, the A students who are outliers at the other end, and then the C students who are kind of the average. Um, and I don't know if anyone out there, maybe you can, you can chat and, and, and share the experience if you have, I have been in a teaching situation where I was required to mark on a bell curve. So I was required to have a C average in my class. Um, and this was at, uh, this was at a university. Um, and the crazy thing was that at the, that university, students could withdraw from classes until the very last day of class. So they didn't have to get an F. Okay, if you think about that and think about how that can skew a bell curve as an instructor. So say, let's say I had a class of uh, 30, say I had 10% Fs, um, so 3%. All three of those students could drop out before the last day of class. And then when I submitted my marks, I still had to have a perfect bell curve. So I didn't necessarily have to fail students, and I chose not to fail students, um, but I had to, you know, try and make a bell curve, and if we didn't, we were called into our department head to explain our uh, poor performance as instructors by not following with departmental protocol. So it does exist out there, and I've experienced it, and it's really not fun. But this is what we want. We try and make statistics out of things and, and get people to fit nicely onto a bell curve. Um, and in that kind of evaluation, the teacher's always at the center of the power. So the teacher's the one giving the grades um, or assigning the grades or the evaluation. Uh, and in literacy, it's the same thing. It would be the tutor or the coordinator. Whoever's in that position of authority is also the one holding the power. Uh, so it's very disempowering for students, right, and, and for learners. Um, it's also highly competitive. So there are winners and there are losers. And it creates a, a situation where if somebody needs to improve their skills, they can easily give up because they can say, I'm not good enough um, and I can't do this. And what they're kind of saying is, other people are better than me and I don't want to engage in this competitive kind of behavior um, and I'm, I'm not going there. So if there are A's, there are F's. If there are winners, there are losers. It's quite a binary system. Uh, and it's all focused around this idea of an authority, that there are people who can tell you uh, when you're right, when you're wrong, um, and how good you are. And it, for anybody that might have any kind of difficulties dealing with authorities in terms of a personality profile or a psychological profile, these traditional forms of evaluation are really tough to swallow. 
Uh, and then finally, the whole thing is based on behaviorist models um, that were used at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, sorry, the end of the Industrial Revolution, and right on through until um, the Second World War. And it's all based on extrinsic rewards. So if you do well, you get an A or you get a gold star. Uh, and it's all about, you know, if, if, if you do well, then you, you earn a reward. If you do poorly, um, you don't get anything or you get a punishment. Uh, and it was the idea that if we trained workers, um, you know, potentially workers for, for factories later on, we wanted them to do certain things um, on a certain timeline and increase productivity. And this was all about having productive factory workers. And uh, that's what our whole education system has kind of been based on for formal and a little bit of non-formal, and that's certainly what our evaluation and assessment has been based on. So the models are more than 50 years out of date, and uh, so now what? I mean, well, we're talking about what's called a deficit-based model. They focus absolutely on the problem, um, the gaps we need to fill, what's wrong with our learners, how do we fix them? There's this notion out there that if only we could stuff our learners and our students with enough knowledge they would be okay. That if only we could fill in their gaps, they would then be complete. Um, and it's a deficit-based model because it really focuses on what they don't have, what they don't know, uh, and then how do we fix them. Unfortunately, those are old rules. Again, they originated in the Industrial Revolution. They don't work anymore. They don't work anymore in an age of, uh, in, in an age of technology. Um, so what happened? What happened was after World War II, everything changed in terms of jobs, in terms of skills, in terms of what we needed uh, to do, um, you know, to have a productive, peaceful world. And technology after World War II, that's kind of when things began to take off. I mean, we think of technology as being a 21st century thing. But really, it started as part of the economic recovery um, after the end of World War II and continued on that vein. It just took them you know, a couple of decades to develop some products. And we had the personal computer in the 1970s. Most of us didn't get one until maybe the 80s or the 90s. And now it's so much part of our world um, that it's, it's really part of what we do. The idea is that we've had a major paradigm shift in the second half of the 20th century, and those old ways just don't work anymore. Here's some statistics that I pulled up for you. This is from 2005. These statistics are from the United States. Um, so the Gen Xers, so that's people who are uh, now I think about 40, maybe 42, somewhere around there, 30, 37 to 42, I think they'd be now. Um, five years ago, six years ago, they spent 20.5 hours per week online or watching TV. Most of it was watching TV. That's a lot of time um, watching TV. That's a part-time job per week, right? Um, and Gen Yers, that's the generation before them, uh, so they're a little bit younger, they had even more time. They spent 23.8 hours per week online or watching TV. If you think back 50 years ago, being online or watching TV weren't even possibilities in anybody's experience because we didn't get a television until, you know, the 1960s. So our world has transformed, and we as people living in it have transformed with it. Um, there's a statistic out there, it's, it's given in a TED Talk, a couple of TED Talks actually, if you like TED Talks, TED stands for Technology um, Entertainment and Design. Jane McGonigal is a young gamer in the United States and she sh shares the statistics that um, 10,000 hours is the amount of time that young people in the United States will play video games for uh, by the time they reach age 21. And for anybody who's a Malcolm Gladwell fan, we know that 10,000 hours is also the amount of time it's required to, um, to take somebody to become an expert in something. And that's based on some 2006 research done um, at Harvard. So he took that and basically popularized it in his book, Outliers, and talks about what does it take to make someone successful. So I took that idea and I translated it into language learning. Um, and I've, I've got the research. I didn't send it to, uh, to Amber and Allison to send you afterwards, but I can certainly share it with you. And I looked at how long does it take somebody to learn a language. Um, and the idea was that if you were completely immersed in a, in a new language, it was about two years. Um, that it would take, so a newcomer coming to this country, and if you were starting from scratch, and I sketched out all these different scenarios, if you were just taking adult education classes, how long would it take you? If you were just learning in school, how long would it take you? Interestingly enough, this 10,000 hours is approximately the amount of time that a student will spend in school until they graduate. 
So I looked, for example, at the Alberta Program of Studies, um, and it talks about not between 900 and 1,000 hours per child per school year. So that takes you to about grade 10 or 11 or 12. By the time we factor in, you know, snow days and field trips, which aren't, you know, technically formal learning, the field trips are, are out of the classroom. Um, but it's about till grade 12. So if you think of a learner who drops out of school in grade 8, grade 6, or grade 3, um, that kind of cuts them off on that trajectory of gaining expertise uh, in a certain area. So I think what we need to do is kind of stop and ask ourselves kind of what are we doing? We're living in a very different world today. It's a, the world of the 21st century. It's a technology-driven world. We need different ways. We need ways that are not deficit-based. Um, and one of my students wrote this down in an effective learning class I taught and read it back to me. I said, you know, we love to learn. We just don't always love to learn in school. Uh, and I couldn't believe afterwards that I said that. And I thought, no, I, I actually do believe that. Um, and that's from someone who spent a lot of time in school and generally enjoyed it, but lots of people don't. So I, I said to my, uh, I've said to my students and I say to my colleagues, now I've got, okay, I've got one question and one challenge when it comes to evaluation and assessment. What can you do? Show me. So the question is this, one question, what can you do? One challenge. Show me. The difference is I'm not asking what they can't do. I'm not asking what their gaps are. I'm not asking um, you know, to, for me to be able to identify places where I can put a red mark on a test. Um, I'm asking what can you do and then show me. Okay. So this transforms everything from a deficit-based evaluation to an asset-based evaluation. Um, and like the other one, there are seven characteristics for it. It flips everything on, it head, on its head because it doesn't show me as the teacher, the instructor, or the person in that authority position what my students don't know. It shows me what they do know. Um, and it shows their, their learning in concrete ways. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as, as we go along. Um, it's based on the, the notion of lifelong learning. What can you do today? How is that better? and more advanced than what you could do yesterday. We talk a lot in literacy and nonprofit about celebrating learning uh, and looking back and say, how, where have we come from? When we share the stories of our learners, we are sharing stories of their journey throughout life as they continue in their, uh, with their learning and showing what they can do. Um, and the locus of power shifts from me as the authority to the learner. Uh, and they then own their learning. For some people, that's hugely powerful. The first time in their lives they've ever been able to own their own learning. Um, and it's highly collaborative. So, you know, you may have heard this, these phrases about being a sage on the stage. That's what teachers have often been, right? The sage on the stage. Uh, and this changes that to a guide on the side. And it encourages teachers to take a step backward and to the side and allow the learners to come forward and be empowered and that we work together with them rather than, you know, sort of being um, higher than them. So it shifts us where we are and it encourages us to work together. And this collaborative model also means that us as instructors are also learners and it forces us to recognize that we're also being challenged and to allow ourselves to be challenged by our learners as we go through. Hugely creative, asset-based evaluation is hugely creative. Uh, anybody who's a fan of Sir Ken Robinson uh, will, will understand the importance of creativity, not only in education, but throughout lifelong learning. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of creativity from my own students and, and learners a uh, little bit later on in the presentation. It's based on the idea of intrinsic motivation. So, you know, Yoda says, if you think back to Star Wars, if there's any Star Wars fan out there, he says, do or do not. There is no try. And in that precise moment, a young Jedi warrior is filled with inspiration and goes out there and is completely empowered to do the job he knows that he has to do. Um, and it's complete intrinsic motivation. Nobody says to him, if you don't do this, then we'll all perish. Um, there's no sense of extrinsic motivation or punishment if the job isn't done. Or if you do this, you will have honor and glory for the rest of your life. No, it's just go out there. Um, and do it, and he does. So asset-based evaluation is based on the same notion of intrinsic motivation. Um, and someone said to me the other day, isn't that a lot harder to instill in someone? Well, the answer is yes, because you can't instill it in anyone. They have to 
um, they have to be able to get it from inside. All we can do is open the door and invite them through it. Um, this is absolutely a global trend that's growing in evaluation and education across the world. Let me give you a couple of examples. In the 1980s, um, across Europe, um, you know, 40 some odd countries got together talking about language learning and said, we've got all of these countries in Europe and no way to commonly assess the language learning that Europeans are doing. They're becoming much more migratory um, as, as peoples and their language skills are needed for jobs. We don't know how to showcase those language skills that people learn not only in school, but also in informal learning contexts uh, with their families and non-formal learning contexts, you know, those Saturday morning type schools um, that are in churches, not only in North America, but in other parts of the world. Um, and how do we capture that? I should point out, by the way, that these ideas of informal, non-formal, and formal learning, they're not my ideas, they're from the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. They coined those terms uh, and then I've taken them and kind of looked at them in terms of literacy and, and language learning. So back in the 1980s, they started a project in Europe um, that eventually developed into what's called the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages, the CEFR, Common European Framework of Reference for Languages. It's now being used in I think approximately 48 countries across Europe. We've started using it in Canada uh, in school boards here and it's the, this idea of lifelong language learning um, assessed in an asset-based way uh, throughout a person's lifespan. They've done a really cool thing there and they're starting students in school with what's called a language passport um, or a portfolio and they're teaching them how to assess their language together with their teacher um, to show what they can do in different languages in Europe. So in French, Italian, Spanish, whatever you need. And then as they go through their um, academic career, through their formal learning, they'll carry their passport with them and the teachers will keep updating it. The really cool thing they've done in Europe is that they've connected it with employers so that employers now know the benchmarks and criteria that's being used across Europe in those 48 countries and they can say in their job postings, we require a prospective employee to have an A1 level in French, a B2 level in German and a C1 level in Swedish and they can ask for these because they're now being used across the country, uh, not just one country, many countries, transnationally across Europe. Um, and I understand that Japan and China are also looking at um, building frameworks that if not adopting that one um, exactly, that they'll build very similar ones. So this is, has the potential to become a global framework for second languages. Um, and what's really, really cool is that about the same time that they were starting to launch this around the turn of the millennium, for languages. Uh, in 1997, we had the International Adult Literacy Survey, so about the same time, within a five-year span, it was the first International Adult Literacy Survey that also had a can-do approach um, for assessment and, uh, and evaluation. One moment. There we go, stop that noise there. So yeah, around 1997 we had the IELTS survey doing about exactly the same thing, um, looking at literacy on an international basis using very same you know, ideas, similar parameters and benchmarks. And then in 2003 we had the second um, international and adult life uh, skills survey, the IELTS 2003, that again took an outside based can-do approach and surveyed 23,000 Canadians. Um, and, and many others in different countries. So also taking this, this um, global asset-based approach to evaluation. It's very exciting and it's a global trend. So here's a couple of the international frameworks in case you didn't get to write them down before. The Common European Framework, uh, CEFR if you want to Google it later on. Um, also being used in Canada by the Edmonton Public School Board. Um, in Canada, Literacy BC has um, um, started with their common literacy benchmarks and, uh, and it's also based on, on IELTS and a very can-do approach or assessment-based approach. Um, the portfolio idea is if we look at um, international frameworks, so think of this on a global scale, the CEFR for example, IELTS would fit in there as well. These are big international, multinational frameworks. The benchmarks would be a provincial um, benchmark. We also have the uh, Canadian language benchmarks which are a little bit different but also 
quite asset-based and it's national. So if we think of the frameworks as being international, the benchmarks as being national or provincial, then the portfolios take it down to the individual level. So you can see how we're incorporating asset-based approaches um, across the sort of different levels, if you will, um, policy levels and, and, and uh, development levels of um, educational administration. So the Europe Pass language passport is what the children in Europe will carry with them from grade to grade and then on in, into their employment. Uh, and interestingly, the, Euro, uh, the Edmonton Public School Board in Canada is now using langu language passports with their children as of, I think, 2010. Um, so this idea of asset-based evaluation, sometimes when I talk to colleagues who subscribe to a more traditional paradigm, they, uh, they say, you know, interesting, but does it really work? Well, I've got a couple of case studies to share with you. Um, so I do lots of work in literacy, but my work with my learners is generally professional de development um, sessions, sort of like this one today. Uh, and I also teach at university, so I can only draw on my own experience, and I'll share that with you. Um, last year, I was recruited to teach a course called Effective Learning um, at the University of Calgary. It's a mandatory course for students who are on academic probation. So I'm dealing, you know, with students that, that don't really want to be there. Um, you know, they want to be in university, but they don't really want to be in my class. But it's mandatory. It's obligatory. And I think, oh, gosh, yeah, I've got to get them through this. I had, um, uh, I had 13 students, and uh, I'll share my experience with them. Uh, and the other case study that I have to share with you is a professional project, uh, professional development project I did in Mexico with my colleague uh, Karen Dodge, who now works at Mount Royal University. We went down there and did some PD with some English teachers in Jalisco in 2008. So I'll give you that one first. Um, 2008, I went down with Karen. Uh, we both speak Spanish, which is why we were recruited for the project, and we did a three-day uh, professional development workshop for ESL teachers or EFL teachers in uh, Guadalajara. So there we were in Guadalajara and we had 24 Mexican um, English language teachers and our job over the three days was to uh, teach them new language teaching methods in three days and um, and then sort of go in and do our work our magic and leave um, and we said well we can't do that. We can't come in for three days. Nobody really can. If you've done any work at all in international development, you can't just fly into a place, do your shtick, and then leave and expect things to change over the long term, you know, because the binders sit on the shelf and they get dusty, and everything that you did in terms of preparation is lost because it doesn't have any meaning. So we asked ourselves, you know, how do we help them create meaning and empower them in a way that they can take the work forward with them after we've left because these three days really are should just be the beginning once we go we want them to be able to do things and affect long-term change so we asked them what's working um, and what are your strengths and how can we help you build on them and how can you build on them um, throughout your teaching practice and the questions were not particularly well received because the model that we were originally contracted for was going in and giving them all the answers and we said no 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 we can do better than that um, the response that we got was a little surprising for us because we heard well nothing's working and we're poor and our students aren't interested we thought okay well um, let's let's see what we can do let's see what we, it, it was really tough to get them to answer these questions what's working um, because they said nothing's working and they have no resources and they have this national curriculum that they have to follow and there's no flexibility in it and they say we, we don't have any money for videos and CDs and the internet connections in our schools are terrible and I thought interesting I hear very similar things uh, when I talk with people about in literacy programs in rural and remote areas of Canada the responses we get were not that different, right? We don't have stuff. If you look at the responses we got, they were all based on deficit models. It was all about identifying the gaps that they had, what they didn't have, uh, and what their students weren't, which they thought was interested. So we kept pushing. What in, is there anything at all that inspires you? And what resources do you have? And what can you do for your students? We really pushed hard and what we were asking for was a paradigm shift. We were asking them to go from focusing on what wasn't working, what they didn't have, uh, and what you know their students weren't, to focusing on what did inspire them, the resources they did have, and what they actually could do for their students. Um, 
our approach was gentle but insistent, um, was the idea that everyone has strengths. So that everyone included the teachers, the system, the administrators, and the students. We said everyone has those strengths. And our challenge is to find them and leverage them unrelentlessly. So it's not that this is an airy-fairy or soft way of going about evaluation and assessment. It's very tough. And it's based, by the way, on what's called an ABCD model, asset-based community development. Um, the original founders of it, I think, were Kretzmann, um, again, back in the 1960s or 1970s. And um, also, it built, who, the guy who built on that was David Cooper Ryder, and he built the appreciative inquiry model um, in the 19, I think it was the 1980s. So it's actually a very tough, hard approach uh, if you're uh, insistent, gentle but insistent. We told them, you know, we're here for three days, and we know, and you know, you're not stupid. We know that a three-day workshop will not change what you do long term. Um, and so it's up to you when, when we leave, um, what can you change? Um, and you change what you do, not some external consultant, right, who does that. And so I think after that they softened a little bit because they knew that we were telling them the truth. We, we knew and they knew. We weren't going in there as some kind of gurus that had all the answers. And in fact, we said, you don't, we don't have all the answers. We're not teaching in your schools. We're not working with your students. We're asking you to find a new way to think that will work for you that's based um, in assets than not in deficits. Um, by the end of the three days, I think that there, you know, there was some hope and there was some willingness to try something new. Most importantly, they had their power back. They had their sense that they could do something uh, and they were able to share um, that they felt their students had a lot of potential. They felt that you know, when the assets they had were things like community, loyalty to one another, strong sense of national pride, strong belief in one another. Um, and that they hadn't considered those things as assets before. They had only thought of material assets in terms of um, paper and pens and books and CDs and technology. Um, and we said, okay, well, think about your community assets as well and, um, and go from there. Um, so there was a little bit of a shift and a, little, and a little bit of hope, and we've been able to stay in touch with some of them afterwards. And it wasn't, you know, large-scale, long-term change. A few people started having conversations that led to changes over time. So, I mean, you can't change Rome in a day, right? Um, my second case that I'll share with you today was my class profile, was my uh, University 205 students. I had 13 students, 80% um, of them were on academic probation, so they had trouble uh, with study skills, they had trouble with reading, they had trouble um, with authority figures. So this um, class was part of a multi-pronged approach to get them ac off academic probation and give them skills that would help them succeed not only in university but also in the workforce. Um, so I also had students with learning disabilities in a, in a class of 13, right? So you can imagine. Um, they were good kids though and I really enjoyed them. Um, the, of course the goal was get them off academic probation. As an instructor that's a lofty goal, right? Think of Yoda, do or do not, there is no try. Um, and so I, I put this to them. Our very first article in our set of readings was students' resistance to change in academic preparation courses. And I thought, great, there's a great deficit-based way to start my semester. So I tossed that article out um, and we started with something else instead. I really challenged them to think about what assets they brought to the university uh, and to their own learning career. And again, it was a bit of a mental shift and a mental challenge. I had very rigorous standards, I said. Even though this is an asset-based approach, it is not fluffy, it is not easy, um, and you will not be putting in any less time than if I just gave you test after test after test. You will probably put in more time. Um, but I also knew that when they left my classroom, they were going out into a world where they would be faced with deficit-based tests, where they would have multiple choice exams, you know, those ones that you have to fill in with a little pencil and draw in the circle, and it's not even marked by a human, it's marked by a Scantron. And I knew that I also had to prepare them for that reality while also introducing them to the idea of asset-based evaluation. So I took uh, three methods, um, three method approach to my class and to their evaluation and assessment. Um, first of all, I took out the final exam. Well, for a bunch of kids who are on academic probation, it's not an effective way for me to assess their learning um, to give them a final exam. In fact, I've um, heard of a study and I've been trying to track it down, so if you know of it, you can uh, please send it to me. And it was that they took a group of college students, gave them their final exams, 
and retested them one month later to see what did they actually retain. And after one month, the college students retained 5%. 5% of their course content was what people uh, retained after one month. And I thought, good grief. And I thought back to myself as a learner. If you've been to university, think of your own experience in university courses and, and your programs or your high school, whatever your formal learning experience has been in your courses. And how much do you actually remember? When I did a, an informal self-assessment, you know, based on my own reflections, I thought, yeah, 5% is about right. So I took out the final exam. I didn't think that that was really going to show me anything. Um, we still had tests, and I took a learner-centered approach. So what I mean by that was um, I said, well, I've got to give you these tests. And uh, so they wrote the test questions. I said, you can't write fluffy test questions. You can't write questions like, how do you feel today, or how did you feel about this lesson? Um, and we came up with a battery of questions. And I said, I will select some of them, and uh, I may add my own if, if I think that these don't really you know, reflect the, the learning. So I engaged them in the process. Um, they also had to do a collaborative group project, so they got a chance to be creative there. And I'll show you some of the creativity that they came up with. I was just so thrilled with it. Uh, and they had to work together. Uh, and I really encouraged them when they did this to think in terms of leveraging the assets and strengths of everybody in their group. So here's an interesting thing about how this started. They said, well, we have to divide the work and it has to be equal. I said, no, it doesn't. It has to be equitable. And by equitable, what I mean is look at each person's capacity figure out what they can do, and challenge them to do it. So, you know, Yoda wouldn't have said, uh, do or do not, there is no try, if he'd been, you know, working with somebody that couldn't go out and do the job. Right, so I said, what did, I had them do a project where they figured out what their assets were, and then, each, so, for example, I had one student who was terrified, terrified of public speaking. I said, yes, you have to do a presentation at the end to the class, but if she's terrified of public speaking, find out what she's good at and have her do that, and somebody else can do the presentation. So that, that kind of threw them for a loop because they thought, well, we have to do a presentation at the end. I said, yes, but that doesn't mean everybody has to present. I want you to use your strengths um, and then build on them. So if somebody's, you know, and in the end, I was absolutely surprised because the student who was terrified of public speaking stood up with her group at the end of the um, at the end of the course and presented with a group. And I said, Corinne, you didn't have to present with your group. We, we know, because um, again, there's only 13 of them, so I got a chance to know them. I said, we know that you hate public speaking. And she said, I know, but I wanted to give myself a challenge. So it was wonderful for me because there is this notion out there that if you only allow people to build on their strengths, they never get good at anything else, right, and that they kind of become a bit lopsided. But she chose, she felt strong enough and empowered enough to try something new. And part of it was that nobody told her she had to, so she then had a choice and she loved it. Okay. I had, I wanted to share this example with you. This was a video that um, some of my students did on effective learning. I put the um, short URL up there, so it's bit.ly slash m capital P 6 KE2. Um, this is one of my students, and I, I didn't ask them to post it on YouTube. They chose to post it on YouTube because they're adults and they can do that. Uh, this is Graham, um, and uh, I think uh, there was a group of four or five of them, five of them in this group, and they did this video on um, effective learning and what it meant to them. Hugely creative project. They had what, somebody in their group who loved doing video editing, and it was a skill that he never got to use in any of his other um, university courses. And I said, go ahead, find a way to use that skill and that talent. And this video ended up being showcased um, in the university newspaper because it was a demonstration of effective learning. So these are students who are on academic probation at the beginning of the semester, and then at the end they were, you know, some of their work is being showcased across campus. So I was absolutely thrilled for them because I really had no part in it other than to say, you know, go out and do this collaborative group project, and this is what they came up with. So if you get a chance to check it out later on, you'd make me hugely proud um, by increasing the number of views and uh, checking out what these students can do. Um, I was just absolutely thrilled. So there's an example of what they came up with, and they got assessed on it. The other thing they did, the third solution that I had, so we did have a test, we did have a collaborative group project, and we did have a learning portfolio, and I've um, taken out all of their names here. I've either covered them up or taken them out using Photoshop, so there's no identifying information in any of these photos. And they all constructed learning portfolios, which had some criteria 
uh, had to be one cohesive project and they were guided along the whole process of what a portfolio was. And I think um, Allison's got a copy of one of the, do the documents Alice, and it would be the document with a, a blue cover um, that you can send out to people afterwards and it talks about how I use these learning portfolios in my class, the process that I went through, how I marked them, and it includes a grading rubric, I think, on how to, um, how to incorporate them. So this idea of a learning portfolio is the same idea that's being echoed in um, the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages. This wasn't a language class, this was a metacognition class, but I've applied the same techniques here and I'm starting to do some research now finding out that the same idea is being applied, can be applied with adult learners in literacy. So you get them to build a portfolio of what they can do. You could easily use the essential skills um, as a, you know, here's what I can do in document use, here's what I can do with reading, here's what I can do with uh, computers and numeracy. And the idea is that the learning portfolio is a living document that gets updated as they go along, right? That they can keep it, but they can see their own progress. And eventually, you know, they might, if they do, um, get a certificate from a program or um, they complete a program and they get a letter of completion or something like that, they add that to the portfolio and they don't call it a learning portfolio, they can then call it a professional portfolio and they can demonstrate to employers what they can do um, and, and, and so on. So if they've had trouble finding jobs, they can you know, put their resume in there and they can demonstrate that they know how to write a resume and that they can say, I, can, I wrote this resume on the computer, um, and so they can demonstrate word processing skills. Um, and, and they've got concrete proof and evidence that they can then carry forward with them. And the really cool thing is nobody's telling them what they can't do. They're showing us what they can do. Um, so I, I think that the idea of a portfolio is absolutely wonderful, not only for students in formal learning situations, but also for learners in non-formal learning situations like literacy tutoring programs. The same idea can be applied. It's not terribly expensive to put into place. So you can see my students here, some of them use binders. I did have one student put his on, on online because he wanted to try that. Uh, it can be a do it tank. doesn't have to be expensive, um, but it can be a way to help people build their confidence and empower who they are as learners, regardless of whether they're in a post-secondary institution or you know, taking one-on-one -on -one literacy tutor training. And in fact, I said to my students, I, I have a portfolio where I keep, you know, old versions of my resume and things like that. And I brought it in and I shared it with them. Um, so it was the idea that I'm not telling you as students what you have to do. I've actually done one myself. Um, mine wasn't as pretty as theirs, but that's fine. I still showed them what I had. So the idea can be used. So if you're working in languages right now or literacy, I would encourage you to consider this as an asset-based way to help you evaluate and assess your learner's progress. Um, had some recommendations for uh, for anyone who's here today. I include them in my professional development workshops for people. Um, one is is just the very idea of opening our minds to new ways of doing things. If you've always been used to using traditional tests where you're marking in red ink, uh, finding out their gaps in learning, try something new um, and see if it works and how it works. And it may not be perfect, and that's okay. It's part of our learning journey as professionals as well. Um, when we worked with the Mexican teachers, we uh, were faced with this question of, you know, well, we've got all of these barriers in our way and there's things we can't do. Who's, we challenged them and said, what can you do? And to start small. Sometimes just being able to take one piece or one idea um, is, is enough. And it's, it, it's always a start and you have to start somewhere. Um, and the idea of always, always, always focusing on what our learners can do and what they do know. We know, for example, adult learners, Stephen Lieb, I think, L-I-E-B, um, fantastic adult education resource. He has these principles of adult learning. And he always says adults, no matter what their formal education is, always come to the table with a wealth of life experience and to be able to leverage that um, in, in the learning situations, whether it's formal or non-formal, uh, it's very, very important for them to have that recognized. And all of this, um, of course, means that we're not giving up our standards. We're still pushing them along that continuum of learning throughout their lifespan. So we're keeping the rigor very high and saying, okay, you, what can you do? And show me, and show me in concrete terms. Um, whether that's a learning portfolio or a video or a letter or something that demonstrates their learning. Um, 
and that's not a test necessarily, right? But there's other ways uh, as we can figure that out that they can demonstrate their learning. And the, uh, the other thing we can do is to have conversations with other, I put teachers there, again, that's kind of the, the area that I work in, instructors, literacy coordinators, literacy volunteers. What I mean there by teacher is anybody who's in that position of authority, who's in kind of a teaching position, um, and have conversations with them. What's working in your practice and what's working in your evaluation? And do you still give these old tests? Um, and how do they work? And what can we do better? Having the conversations is really a critical piece of it because we know that change comes slowly. And this is one way to, uh, to get it going. Um, and engage people in that discussion, in that dialogue. I got to say, I'm really looking forward to our dialogue here in a couple of minutes. Um, and if you do work with young children and you're working in early childhood literacy programs um, and you're looking at implementing some of these asset-based evaluations, um, have conversations with parents. And when I say that, uh, you know, if you're looking at not including tests but instead doing something like a portfolio, this can make a lot of parents uncomfortable, particularly if they come from a background uh, where there was a lot of tests and there was a lot of uh, authoritarian teacher attitudes. They may not like it. They may you say, well, would you like it if we did this with your child? The answer might be no. A better question I found uh, when I'm working with, with some parents in some of the nonprofit programs that I work with is, if you had been given the opportunity to show your learning and celebrate that learning, would it have made a difference to you in how you feel about education? Um, so the key question is, would it have made a difference to you? And so they may think back to their own learning experience as a student, remember a time when they had a bad experience with a teacher or an exam or something, and they might just think, yeah, it, it would have made a difference to me. To ha uh, they'll often couch it in terms of a teacher who cares. Those teachers who care are often the ones that have the students show them what their um, students can do and uh, put them at the front and center of it all. So that question for parents, uh, would it have made a difference to you, is a very, very powerful one. Um, and if you can, you know, if they're adult learners, particularly incorporating them into that evaluation process. And, and um, I, in my case, I helped my, my students help me write their final test. And I was okay with that because I knew my material well enough that I knew what had to kind of be incorporated in that sort of thing. And uh, with, their, um, with their other ones, I showed them a rubric. And I said, um, if you know, let's talk about this and see if you think that this is a fair way to evaluate your learning. And in general, they did. Um, I got some questions and some feedbacks, and I tried to incorporate them as much as I could into the collaborative process, knowing, of course, we always work within systems and have to respect our systems. Um, and in terms of the group project, I tried as much as I could to take out the competitive aspect um, and really insist that they collaborate and find ways to work together. And as I was doing this with my university classes, I had the nine essential skills from literacy in the back of my mind. And I knew that you know problem solving is an important skill there um, and, and the thinking skills as well. And those are the soft skills and being able to for students to work together. And I wanted them to have that and be able to take that forward with them into their work life. So even though I was teaching a university level course, you know, I often try to incorporate things like the Canada's nine essential skills in, um, in that effective learning course. Um, and then helping others understand the process and that there is rigor behind it and how do we do it and how do you evaluate this and what is a rubric and how do we evaluate portfolios. Um, and if they're really resistant to the idea of it and only like tests, then have the conversation with them and see where they stand and what might work. Or also find out what they're doing now. That's always a good one. Um, Personally, in my own teaching, I don't want my students to regurgitate information to me anymore. So, for example, the other topic that I teach is I teach Spanish. Um, it's very typical for me, you know, us to have tests where they've got to write the vocabulary words, they've got to write verb conjugations. They're kind of regurgitating um, information. I want them to be able to demonstrate to me that they can use the language so that when they go to a country or they're volunteering in a jungle in El Salvador, that they will be able to come up with language that they can actually use. So I try and replace the regurgitation with some form of creativity while maintaining that rigor. Okay. It does take a lot more time, I'll be honest, and way more rewarding. Um, and the idea of it, small steps, right? We can't necessarily change systems in a day, 
depending on what kind of organization you work in, you may not be able to implement everything um, that you would like to do, but the idea of taking small steps, it might be a conversation with someone today. It might be um, the suggestion at the next meeting of using portfolios, you may have it quashed, bring it up again. It's okay, you, we do what we can, and every little single step along the way matters. Um, and one of the things I'm a big, big proponent of, as you can probably figure out through this, is the idea of having conversations with educators at every single level. So that means including people um, in from the nonprofit world, from K to 12, through colleges, and getting conversations that focus around our learners as complete human beings who engage in informal, non-formal and formal learning. Um, so I'll give you an example. At universities, we tend to be very insulated and only talk to other professors, perhaps at other institutions, but mostly at our own institutions. And I think, well, we've got students coming from community colleges, and they can transfer in here. So why wouldn't we be talking to them about that um, as well and kind of get the conversations going across um, you know, across sectors, whether it's profit or nonprofit. It's all about the learning. No. It's all about the learners and their journey as we, um, as we go through. So uh, I think having conversations is a big recommendation for me. Um, we know globally that the trends are changing, uh, slower in some countries than in others, but the trends are happening. It's becoming much more learner-driven, uh, and we're getting learners who are much more self-actualized. And much of this is driven by, uh, driven by technology and the fact that learning is available all the time now wherever we want. I mean, there's thousands of recorded webcasts available. People can go on to iTunes University and download whatever they want. Uh, it's being driven by learners. It's being driven by um, self-directed and autonomous learning um, philosophies, if you will. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. And this is kind of where we're going and how do we keep up? Let's do what we can to help them, uh, help them and help ourselves along our own learning journey. I always challenge the students, show me. Show me what you've got. Don't just show me what you've got. Show me the very best of what you've got. What can you do? Show me. I'm not interested in what you don't know. So, um, and then my final thing for you is to be the inspiration for, for learning. So there's my Twitter address. Um, and feel free to connect uh, on the blog and, uh, and ask questions. As you can see, I've brought the uh, control panel back up here. So I would love to take... Um, some questions now if you have them feel free to type them in the chat box and uh, Allison and Amber if you're there and you'd like to um, join in feel free to do so do we have time for some questions I think we have time for some questions Oh, I do see some questions here. Okay. Oh, fabulous. People are telling us where they're from. Okay, I got a question here. Um, yeah, isn't the workplace still based on a productivity model? Uh, yes, absolutely, and I think that there are ways to integrate that with a can-do assessment model and show me what you, uh, what you can do. Um, and sometimes, though not always in the workplace, that a person's performance will be assessed on, um, on what they can do. And it's also based on other things, of course, you know, their, um, their skills, their interpersonal skills, and so forth. So, yeah, I'm just going to go through some of these questions here. So, yes, Jane, I believe the, the webinar will be recorded. Absolutely. Okay, let's have a look here at this one. Uh, question, are, are there asset-based evaluations for adult learners, specifically those who may have worked in one specific sector of the work world? Um, wow, that's a fantastic question. And my answer is, I don't know, but I wish I did know. I'm going to have a look at it. Um, I have been doing some research now, and you'll, you'll get a copy of it. I've got a, um, it's a sort of an annotated bibliography. It would be the one with the brown or the beige cover on the resource, and it's, um, an annotated bibliography of everything I could find on asset-based evaluation for languages and literacy. And there is a document out of Manitoba, Canada that might be um, of some use to you, and I can't remember it off the top of my mind, but it was talking about um, asset-based language, I think, in the workplace. So I don't know that it's been done yet for specific sectors, but maybe there's a research project we can do.
Okay. Um, I'm not quite sure about that question, so um, let me just check this one. Have I seen any research that brings some of the concepts in a best practice model for online teaching and learning? Um, it, that's also a great question, and uh, I think what comes to my mind right now is a video that actually one of my students sent me after our course from that effective learning class on. It's called the gamification of education, and it looks at um, online video games and how principles from video games can be incorporated into education. That's a really sticky, hot topic, and lots of people have issues with that, particularly if they live in a household where they feel um, other members of the household spend too much time gaming. Um, but uh, it's the principles behind it. I, I, I think it's fascinating in theory, um, but I haven't seen uh, seen too much of it specifically for online teaching and learning. Um, Jane McGonigal is another person who's done a TED Talk uh, who might be, um, I think hers is called Gaming Can Make a Better World, and that might be a good one to, uh, to look into. So, no, I, I'll keep looking into that. Any other questions before we wrap up today? Okay, let's have a look here. I'm just going to go back up, see if I... Okay, so I got Rod's question. Um, I'm just not seeing any of the questions. So it's under the question part um, of your GoTo control webinar panel. You could also use the chat box if you like. Um, yeah, in the U.S., don't we have to get politicians on board? It's all based on test scores. Yeah, I know. The, the U.S. is um, very, very enamored with its... Um, standardized achievement tests, and I say that about the U.S., but I know that we have provincial achievement tests here in Canada, and we're, certain educators are very, very enamored with them, too. Um, yeah, this is one of those things where it, it may take international frameworks and things, like the Common European Framework, to start slowly changing things. Um, and my suggestion, or my, you know, I, in talking with U.S. educators, I, I've had this same question again and again and again because um, you know it's all about the state test scores and the state um, what do you call it uh, standards and being able to match the standards and that kind of thing. Um, I think in this case it may have to start as a grassroots thing there and work its way work its way up. So there's two ways things can go, right? It can be the top down policy level down, like they've done with the Council of Europe, or it can be from the ground up with individual teachers. I know from my US um, colleagues, I did a presentation uh, in Tennessee last week, well from Calgary via webinar about this, and uh, they were interested in it, but also found the same barriers there. And we talked about it and thought that maybe um, grassroots starting from the bottom up. Um, while still preparing them for their tests, right? Like with my university students, I knew they'd have to go do tests. So you can't necessarily change the system, but you can work within it and also give them that sense of empowerment. Um, great question. So the students from the effective learning class integrated back into their other classes. Well, they weren't necessarily integrated back into their other classes. They were taking other classes at the same time. So some of them had, I think they were allowed to take up to three classes. Um, and so they were taking two other classes at the same time, most of them. And so they were integrating what they learned throughout their semester. And in their portfolios, I had them include demonstrations of work from other classes, like lab reports or essays or papers. And, and they commented on the teacher's feedback, if they got feedback on it, and how they felt they were improving their own learning process as they went through. So I had them do um, a lot of reflection. So I should say that. Um, uh, I had 80% of the students were on academic probation. At the end, all but one were able to get off academic probation. So one student didn't make it, um, and for a variety of reasons, right? She had other stuff going on. Um, so it wasn't all about this class. But in many cases, they became self-regulated. They became empowered. They had the skills. Um, they had practical skills combined with theoretical skills. So I taught them how. I gave them um, things like how to read an academic article. And we did stuff around time management and taking notes and learning to take tests and manage stress in test-taking environment. Um, so lots of practical stuff as well as the, as the theoretical. Um, so I guess the proof is in the pudding and that most of them, with the exception of one, were able to continue on the next semester. Um, and then Ursula's asking, um, they really resist taking part in their own learning, prefer to be told what to do. I know. Isn't that crazy? 
Yeah, I get that as well. And in fact, we had that with the Mexican teachers, and had that I had that to some degree with the um, with the effective learning. There is this um, notion, uh, particularly um, without wanting to stereotype too much, but with older learners or with learners from um, you know aren't necessarily from um, Canada or. Yeah, yeah. My mom was from from the UK, and she had the same idea that the teacher is the authority and needs to tell them what to do. It's quite tough because you're asking for a paradigm shift and an attitude shift there, and it's uh, you're saying no, you go, you own it, uh, do it, and it's the idea of being that gentle but insistent. And if you can do it with them over time. Um, then, then that's really helpful, and it's the idea of them wrapping their heads around their learning, their life, their responsibility, guided but not owned by you. Okay. So I think those are all the questions I have here. And the question, oh no, okay, I've got a couple more here. Can I repeat the name of the adult educator I mentioned a little while ago? I think uh, you might be referring to Stephen Lieb, L-I-E-B. Um, and if you want to write to me or connect with me after um, through the through the blog there, I can send you um, a URL or a website that he's got. It's a really great, prints out into two pages, Principles of Adult Learning. So Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-L-I-E-B. Okay. Um, we did do an assessment with them. Um, uh, if the question is, did you do an assessment on the teachers in Mexico to understand if they were able to use uh, in their daily teaching what they achieved in the three-day workshop? We Again, we had to use a bit of a combination approach, so it wasn't all just about asset-based or um, about learning, but we were also giving them some practical tools on um, different ways of communicative language teaching and so forth. We were able to stay in touch with um, some of them afterwards. And they told us that they were able to start conversations with their students. The tricky thing with some of this type of learning and assessment is it's more difficult to quantify than the traditional tests. So again, that's another bit of a learning paradigm or sh shift because we value what we can quantify. And if we can't put it into numbers, we somehow think that it's less important. Um, and again, people like Sir Ken Robinson, when he talks about incorporating creativity into education and learning across the lifespan, sort of downplays the use of numbers um, and sort of upplays the uh, the use of creativity. So yes, we were able to assess them, and um, the feedback that we got back was that um, it was it was a good start, but it wasn't necessarily enough, and they still struggled a little bit with them. Um, with sort of falling back into what we don't have and that kind of thing. It would have been great to go back and do another project again with them six months later or a year later. As it happened, it didn't turn out that way, um, but the feedback we got was pretty positive. Yeah. So uh, Nikisha has a question. If possible, how can you help strengthen the weak areas of language learning students with the asset-based approach while focusing on their strengths? Um, the principle in appreciative inquiry the Cooper writer talks about um, is to not really focus on the weak areas, um, but that, that that doesn't necessarily ignore them. But the idea is that as you build on the strength areas, so the less strong areas also increase sort of naturally without focusing on them. Um, so I'll give you an example. If I have a student who you know doesn't have great verb conjugations in second language learning, and um, I, I really need them to work on their verb conjugation, I say, okay, so let's you know you're you're very good with your verbal, so let's focus on that. And how do we strengthen it? How do we make your oral communication as good as it can be? And how do we refine it and keep the eloquence levels high, keep you articulate? So I have them focus on things like being articulate and being eloquent because those things might be important to that learner um, because they pride themselves on being you know that they can debate or they can talk to anybody or they can be persuasive and then I say okay so one of the ways we can sharpen that is to sharpen your use of, um, of verbs so how do we do that and let's have a look at how we can sharpen your use of verbs so I kind of come at it almost indirectly and don't focus on it as being a weak area at all but continue to drive them to um, challenge them to do the best they can in the area that matters to them and the, the weak areas come along as you go through it Um, yes, I can give you links to the articles that I um, gave my students on time management and note taking and how to read an article. I think I've posted most of them on uh, Scribd, S-C-R-I-B, like boy, D, like David. Um, I've got all kinds of 
my um, stuff up there for my students. And I've got grading rubrics for presentations and things like that. So um, again, connect with me through the blog and I can send you the Scribd account if you can't find me. I think my Scribd account might be might be Dr. Sarah Eaton. Sarah Eaton's a pretty common name, so that was one of my only differentiating ways to do it. Um, so yeah, I'd be happy to share that with you. So Diane's asking, do the paradigm paralysis of expecting marks? Yes, it can be tough to help learners understand the less than quantitative measure. How can we help learners adjust to the shift of feedback and not depend so much on the aspect of how good am I? It's a long, uh, it's a little bit of a long process. Um, and it almost starts with a shock. At the beginning of, we, we noticed the same thing in Mexico with the teachers in a PD session that we noticed um, with the effective learning students um, at the University of Calgary, that the first time you ask them, you know, show me what you can do, and um, here's a, I, I give them a, an activity, the university students, an activity called Head, Hands, Heart, asking them to show me what they could do. The first reaction is, well, why do you want me to do this? And what does this mean? And this is dumb. Or, or we have nothing. So it's all kind of based in you know the negativity and the deficit model and so forth. And you say, as I, yeah, I, gentle but insistent, show me what you can do. And so s part of it is just kind of getting them over an initial hump of starting to get them to think in a different way. So it's a paradigm shift not only for us as instructors, but also for them as learners. Um, and in the end, you know, I always try and connect it to what's going to go on in their lives afterwards and what's going to go on in their work. Um, so yeah, the, the, bo the boss may help them uh, understand how good they are, how good they're not through quantitative measures as they go on, but they need to be able to demonstrate their skills and also be able to assess where they want to improve and grow, right? That's also a question that comes up in in the workplace. I won't say that it's a quick process. I had much better success working with students over 13 weeks in an effective learning course than we did working for three days, of course, right? So part of it is if you can build the relationships with people and um, talk to them um, over a period of weeks, it does help. Uh, and the other part is, I mean, I've been looking at this now since 2007. Um, and the first time I came across it, I wasn't sure how to start incorporating it. So I did lots of reading of my own and um, I read lots about appreciative inquiry and started to change my own thinking. And there are times when even I go back and I think, well, you know, I stink at this or I'm not good at that. And I think, well, I'm supposed to be all about this asset-based stuff. Um, so it's not a black and white thing. It's not that you're, um, you know, asset-based one day and deficit-based the next or vice versa. Definitely a continuum. Um, so I hope that that answers your question, Diane. Uh, thanks, Vicki, for your comment. Much appreciated. Looks like you had to go. Um, so I'm going to go down here and take Helen's question. I think that'll probably be the last one unless we have any more. Um, Helen says, employers uh, still seem to want to see that a worker has grade 12 first. They aren't interested in uh, hearing that the worker has to offer. How do you deal with that? They don't want to take the time to look at the applicant. It's a great question, and it's based on social norms, the idea of that formal education, right? That green um, uh, circle in the Venn diagram. If they're missing that green circle, the idea of what they can accomplish as learners, as productive humans, as productive workers is completely diminished. So it's um, it's really tough. I mean, if you want, you could you could work with prospective employers if you have that privilege and being able to say, well, here's here are some of the other things that we take into account. Um, and the interesting thing is that um, there's been this sort of escalation of uh, formal education in the past, you know, again, 50 years or so. And uh, it, it used to be that the old master um, at something didn't necessarily have a degree in what they were doing. They learned their craft and then they passed it on through an apprenticeship model. And that model's been around for hundreds of years um, and has worked very well. Uh, and now we've taken it and formalized it and stuck it into um, technical and polytechnical colleges. But the models of non-formal education have been around since, I don't know, hundreds of years for sure. Um, so be, being able to talk to employers um, about that. I, I don't know that you'll be able to ultimately change anybody's idea if they are stuck in that idea. You must have grade 12. You might not be able to change it, but the idea of starting conversations is is the place to uh, to start for sure. Okay, I think that probably wraps us up. Oh no, there's some more questions. Wow, there's a few more questions. Okay. Yeah, agreed. I'm going to go through a couple of these real quick here. 
How do I see the asset-based evaluation assessment uh, apply to employers looking for skills and competencies? Great question, uh, Sharon. So the idea is, um, I just hired a research assistant uh, this week actually for a project that I'm working on and here's how I approached it. I looked at my overall project which is a literature review on second language acquisition and education. I thought, okay, what are my strengths? So seeing the, asking the employer to look at their own organization, um, if it's a small employer they can look at themselves or the organization, what are our strengths? What are we good at? And what do we need? to be good at other things, right? What do we want to be good at other things? So in my case, my literature review, um, I'm really good at looking at the pedagogy and education stuff. My work also requires me to include technically linguistic things like morphology, syntax, um, uh, transfer, reverse transfer, and things having to do with linguistics that quite frankly I haven't studied. And I thought, I want somebody whose strength is in linguistics. So I found somebody who, um, I think she's a syntactician is her formal title, uh, and that's her strength. So I use her strength and leverage it against my strength, so together we're going to be able to produce uh, a literature review that includes both the linguistic um, aspect and the education aspect. So I think, okay, what's my project? What do I want to do? What strengths do I have? And then what strengths do I need um, to do that? So I hope that that, that helps. Um, so. Okay, Diane's got another question here. It looks at how do you focus on specific language learning when working in group collaborative work while still keeping learners interested and not intimidated to express themselves literally and keeping the momentum going? It's a great question. Um, and I think probably one that every language teacher has, uh, has faced out there. Um, because you do, you have learners across that, if you will, continuum of introversion versus extroversion. And one of the things that I did with my um, effective learning students and it's not my um, self-assessment it belongs to somebody else and I can't remember the person's name right now I like to give credit where credits due, and I just can't remember the person's name but it, anyway it was a self-assessment tool for groups um, and it was asking people to identify their preferences in groups so are you a natural leader are you a natural note taker are you a natural um, listener are you a natural organizer and then have people if they can work uh, to their strengths in a group um, and uh, have people en encourage each other to, to leverage their strengths. We tried that in the effective learning group and it worked very well in general. In one group we, um, so I ended up dividing students so I had the number of groups was sort of the self-identified leaders. I had one student who was absent so she came, we had I think four or five groups and she self-identified as a leader. So I said, okay, well, we've already got these groups and we've already got the leaders who self-identified as leaders. You're going to be matched and you're going to co-lead with someone and you guys are going to figure it out as you go along and that's part of your challenge. So show me what you can do there. So even allowing them to have their preferred style and then once they were comfortable there, they were able to um, kind of work with each other a little bit and work a little bit outside their comfort zone. Okay. And some of them self-identified as leaders at the beginning and at the end said, yeah, I'm not sure I'm quite ready for leadership yet. I like the idea of it, but it was a lot of work or I want to build my skills there. So they had um, some different revelations at the end, if you will. Okay. okay, Sharon says, how do you see the asset based evaluation and assessment apply to employers looking for skills and competencies? I think we did that one. Um, so I'm going to keep going here. A couple other questions. I think that's it. I think, did I get all the questions? Uh, yes. Um, is it possible to find material about what I do also in Spanish? Most of what I have done has been in English uh, because I share a lot of it at um, PD conferences and so forth. But if you write to me, I'll send you what I have, um, which might not be very much, but I'll share what I have. Okay. Penny says, from what I'm hearing regarding asset-based assessment, it requires a lot more work slash creative abilities and a wider range of teaching tools to pull it off well. Do you have resources or video resources showing this type of asset-based assessment in practice as visual learners would appreciate seeing this in action? Um, Penny, th what might be interesting for you is the, um, the uh, literature review that... Uh, that I sent to the Ontario Literacy Coalition to uh, to distribute. So um, they're going to send it around to people and if for any reason you don't get it, feel free to contact me through the blog and um, and I can send it to you. It's also on Scribd, I think. Uh, and there were a couple of videos in there. So yeah, I think that there were, there were six 
um, different multimedia things in there along with uh, practical classroom resources and some research-based stuff. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, I'm scrolling down after Penny's question and I don't see any other questions. If for any reason you did have a question and I missed it, I will apologize now and say please do ask it. Um, send me a note via the blog and um, I would be happy to, uh, to answer it or share whatever I can with you um, as we go along. So I think that will formally close the, um, the session today. Thank you so much for staying here. We are absolutely over time, a little bit, 12.20. Really appreciate you staying. Um, Amber, I think you can probably close up the recording now, and I will stay around for a few more minutes. To um, I can't, if, if there are any other questions that I've missed, then I will try and answer them here. Thanks for being here, everyone. Absolute pleasure.